In our previous example, when we talked about this, we kind of made the assumption that interest will only compound once per period. In particular, that was once per year, but there's no reason to restrict ourselves in that way. We can talk about something being semi-annual in terms of its compounding rate. That is, it does so twice per year, or quarterly if it does it four times per year, or monthly for 12 times, or weekly for 52, or so on, which is something we'll talk about in a little bit. But for now, the main thing I want us to see is the general formula for compounding interest, which is given by A equals P times the quantity 1 plus R over N raised to the power NT, where we can think of this formula as being an extension on the last one we saw, wherein we split that rate into n parts and make up for that by taking the value there t, the number of units of time we have, and multiplying them by n times per period. And again, we've got a lot of numbers, a lot of symbols to chase around here, but I think it'll make a little more sense if we see this in the context of the example, where in particular, this is an example with a bit of historical weight to it. So here we have that the island of Manhattan was said to have been sold to Peter Minuet of the Dutch West India Company in 1626 for a sum equivalent to $24. Supposing this was put into an account with 5% interest, compare the value it would be worth if this was simple interest to if the interest compounded monthly. So first look, this example is a little bit odd. But I want to bring it up here because this is a very famous anecdote. It commemorates the day centuries ago when our ancestor, Sir Reginald Wong, bought Mars from stupid natives. How can you call the native Martians stupid? They sell whole planet for one bead. Sounds stupid to me. <laughs> <laughs> that is stupid. That in particular got brought up at the beginning of this section as well as the last one in our textbook. So I want to set the record straight just a little bit, because I think as it's presented there, it's, it's a bit unfair. And the first, to me, most obvious way that this is unfair is that it's a little bit silly to expect that even if the tribe in question had been able to keep all of their money in that account without ever taking it out themselves, well, they almost certainly would have gotten screwed over by the colonists at some point there, like they did at every other turn, and for that matter, there are only two banks on Earth that have been running continuously since that time in the 17th century. So getting that out of the way and assuming that I guess they were cryogenically frozen and were able to avoid messing with it for all that time to let the interest grow to exorbitant amounts. Hmm. We don't seem to have your retina scan, your fingerprint, or your colonic map on file. Yeah, well, I did open the account over a thousand years ago. What about my ATM card? Do you still remember your PIN number? Okay, you had a balance of 93 cents. All right. And at an average of two and a quarter percent interest over a period of 1,000 years, that comes to $4.3 billion. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are still some details with that story that might be apocryphal, might not entirely be true, and even if they are true, are a little bit misrepresented. So for one, the way the story usually goes here is that the tribe who sold the island of Manhattan were the ones who generally used it, the Wapinger tribe who used Manhattan Island as a hunting grounds. And I'm sorry if I pronounced that name wrong. I've never actually been to New York City, so I'm not positive how they would say that or how the people then would have said it, but I'm trying my best. However, the Dutch really weren't trying their best because there's a lot of evidence that the people they sold it to were, in fact, the Canarsie tribe. And again, sorry if I get that one wrong for exactly the same reason, but they lived not on Manhattan Island, but on Long Island, more specifically in the area that would become Brooklyn far down the line, where they did reach into lower Manhattan, the southern shores there, but not all that much. And then for that matter, the sum $24 that often gets repeated, well, that comes from a report in a secondhand letter which says that they were traded about 60 guilder worth of goods, where guilder was the Dutch currency, 
and the value there being estimated at $24 is circa the mid-19th century, where in today's money, it'd be closer to $1,000. So the amount sold is off by a factor of 50, but still a very good deal for the Dutch, assuming they actually sold it to people who could have even considered themselves owners without getting into the concept of whether or not the idea of land ownership meant the same thing or that trade meant the same thing in any way. Point is, presenting it the way that it is, as it's often told, isn't really fair to the scenario. But anyway, let's actually talk about well, what kind of money they might have made in this case using that unrealistic assumption. So if we assume that we have simple interest here, Sorry, my pen is complaining with me because I spent too long talking. I'm sure you are as well, so you can sympathize. We would have that the amount is given by the principal, 24, multiplied by 1 plus the rate there of 5% times the time period here, which would be from 1626 to 2021, or a total of, oh, that's not a 2, 396 years, which would give us a total of $498, which is to say less than they would have got from the value of inflation, and not a particularly good deal, unfortunately, as many of the other deals that the tribes would get from the colonists and the Americans, like I said. However, on the other hand, if we assume that they take something with compound interest, in particular compound interest that compounds monthly, there we would be following the formula A equals P times 1 plus R over N to the NT, where in this case P is still only $24, 1 is still 1, R is still 0.05, but now we're dividing that into 12 parts because it compounds 12 times per year. And then up here, we're going to get the really silly value of 395 times 12. And this is where compounding interest really explodes, is in that exponent. Because we're going to end up in there with something that gets raised to over the, what would that end up being, like 4,000 power quite a lot so much in fact that we will end up here with a value of eight billion seven hundred three million seven hundred sixty eight thousand five hundred forty seven so hey if they could make all of these unrealistic things happen put their money into a compounding interest account that compounds monthly, a monthly compounding interest account, and that's the wording there, yeah, they'd be billionaires as a tribe. Although really that's not quite that much money either, because, you know, if someone told, say, Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos that uh, they could buy Manhattan Island for $9 billion, they'd be on a plane to New York today writing up that contract. Thankfully, it's not quite how it works. Anyway, the next thing we're going to look at here is how we can extend this idea of the general form for n compounding times per period to what is called continuously compounding interest.